I know we have some time, so but since you are here, I think it's okay if you can. Uh, so just to show off, hands, how many of you are already coding with React or going to evaluate it right away? And then one, two. That's it. Okay. What are the, what are the frameworks do you use? I, I know we are in a jQuery conf. <laughs> That's okay, but <laughs> uh, uh, how many of you use Backbone here? Okay. Angular? Okay. Uh, Ember? Only two? Okay. Who? Cool. Any other frameworks? Just shout it out if. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, how many of you, are, uh, how many of you code in ad other than JavaScript here? Okay. Java, I suppose, or which other language? Ruby, Python, Python, okay. Uh, how many of you in Ruby? One. Oh, two, okay. Closure, anybody? Wow, okay, there's only one. Okay, we gotta fix this. <laughs> cool, I'm, I'm just filling time. So you can ask me anything. By the way, some of, do you know some crazy fun facts about JavaScript? Do you know undefined is not a keyword in JavaScript? You can actually do var undefined is 20. How many of you know that? <laughs> you knew that already? Cool, okay. Yeah, I, I know, but that's no fun, actually. So, <laughs> um, and, and you know, the, this is the other thing, um, where actually NAN is never equal to anything. I mean, like, NAN is not even equal to NAN. That's weird, actually. Yeah, yeah but then you, you, you have a value, and it's like a value, and you expect some value to be equal to some other value, but, or at least to itself. <laughs> By the way, what do you, okay, what is type of undefined in JavaScript? Type of undefined is undefined? Yes. Oh, type of undefined, type is null as object, see? Uh, yeah, I, I can't even keep up. But what would you have if uh, null instance of object? What would that evaluate to, null instance of object? False. <laughs> yeah, but if it's type is object, then it's, let me check. Oh yeah, let's let's see. This is a fun thing. Yeah. Yeah, I did that, and it's false. So, that's JavaScript. It's a couple of minutes more, so, yeah. I've been trying to do a stand-up routine around JavaScript. I think it's a fun idea. I'm sorry? Yeah, 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 I mean, of course, you would never use any of this code in production. It's just uh, fun things to do with JavaScript, actually. I don't know, how many of you watched the VAT talk? VAT, W-A-T, VAT, by Gary Bernhardt. Nobody? Oh, man, okay. So, anyway. So, I guess we can start now, or do we have some time? Maybe we'll, for a couple more minutes before people come in.
I guess people are coming, so let's start. Uh, hi, everybody. So uh, my name is Bagni. Um, so I'm going to talk about Elm, actually. So Elm is a, it's a sort of a weird language. It's a functional programming language, right? So what do we mean by functional language? So a language which deals with functions as first-class citizens, but we know JavaScript already does that. It actually takes things and moves things around. But Elm is also sort of a pure language where it doesn't allow for side effects. So generally, functional languages are, um, are popular for not allowing side effects. So what does that mean, side effects? So if you call uh, A equals 1, and then you do A equals 2, basically you have redefined A and destroyed the value of A, actually, which is not true, actually, which, which, which is absurd if you think about it in a, when you are making an assertion that there's something equals to the other. So if A is 5, then 5 is A. Right? I mean, it, it, it can't be any other way. Now, functional languages actually uh, are very strict about it, about enforcing those kind of things. And whenever you call a function, you, if you call it with some argument, it should always return the same result. So given that you say uh, times 2 of 4, it should always give you back 8. Right? It shouldn't go and do something else, and the world should just be the same as you left it. Right? But that's not very useful. I mean, it, it's mathematically beautiful and pure and all that. So, but if you only have pure functions, right, and they don't cause any side effects, that means that you can't write to the screen, you can't read and write to network, you can't read and write to databases, and basically all you would do is make the box hot, actually, and not do anything. Now, the goal of all these functional languages is how do you work around these side effects, right? Uh, and different languages have different ways of doing that. Elm uh, thinks about it as signals, actually. So if you think of how the browser works, uh, basically it's in a big run loop, right? Where uh, every, every time it, the, the whole thing happens and you have various events which happen, like uh, window resizes or your mouse moves or something clicks on something or you received a new data because of an Ajax call and so on and so forth. So there are several th things that happen and your JavaScript is basically reacting to it. And that's why you have the whole thing about callbacks in JavaScript, right? I mean, you, JavaScript is asynchronous. You have to have something call you back when something happens. You can't block on anything. And that leads to a lot of problems. I mean, the callback style development is a lot of problems. Now, Elm is one way you can get out of this callback hell, right? Um, so br briefly, a commercial break before we go in. So I, I stole this from Naresh yesterday. So uh, I run this company called Tarka Labs. It's a small business division of Serene Technologies. Uh, we do web and mobile development. Uh, mm -hmm. Off late, I've been doing a lot of JavaScript, way more than I, what, I, what I enjoy or what I want to do. So I've been node, doing Node.js on the server. I've been doing React, Immutable, and this thing on the client. Um, but my heart lies with functional programming languages. My heart lies with making elegant and beautiful solutions for the problems that I come across every day. And before, uh, in fact, my introduction to React was not through React itself, but was through a framework called Ohm, which is in Clojure Script, actually. Now, that has a very, I mean, Clojure is also a very functional programming language, and it comes up with this idea where view is a pure uh, function. So you, whatever view you write is a, com is a result of whatever state you manipulate. So as long as you have your state in the right place, view will always reflect it. Right? There's no way you can actually have one representation on the view and nothing on the server. That means that data always, or the flow happens in one direction. You change something in the state, and the view changes. And that's the only way you can change the view, is to make changes to the state. And that's how it works. Now, I was inspired by Ohm, because that radically simplified the UI solution. But then, if you go to a client and I say, hey, I'm going to build your stuff in a programming language which nobody understands, and it's going to be like Lisp, and it's going to get compiled from Java, closure to Java to JavaScript. Like it's, it's not going to fly, actually. So I was looking for ways in which I can take those learnings back into JavaScript, and that's how it worked. And similarly, when I did Elm, uh, I, I, I mean, that actually reinforced my pattern of how to think about uh, a functional view of a particularly imperative style of programming, because I have written uh, from, I mean, before jQuery days, I've been doing JavaScript. So it's been a very imperative sort of 
a language, but apparently using JavaScript, you can write very beautiful functional programs as well. So that's a little bit about me. So let's, let's get into Elm, okay? So are you guys able to see that? Uh, you want to change the theme? Okay, it's going to be a little difficult, but hold on. Just bear with me for one moment. Is this better? Okay. Okay. So this is the obligatory hello world program. So where you have a main function and all it does is show of a string, okay? Now show is a function which takes any object and turns it into a element. So uh, in, so Elm is, a, Elm is a sort of a, it's, uh, it's a Haskell type language, so it uses type inference to do that. So it is strongly typed, that means that you can't randomly give some type to some function which it doesn't expect and expect, I mean, like JavaScript doesn't do coercions and things like that. You have to be very explicit about types, but it doesn't insist on the programmer typing out the types, like how Java, Java does. Right? Java is very particular about, okay, if you if there is something, you've got to label every single thing. It's like an OCD for Java programmers to name things and label things and so on and so forth. But uh, it's not like that. So generally, main has this form element. Okay, so it says element is not found, that's because it's there, so yeah. The main, so main actually re returns an element, and it does that, okay? Now let's start with something simple, right? In, uh, in your, so I'm going to come from a perspective of a JavaScript programmer. So you say a person is, I say name equals Vagni, and place equals Bangalore, Now, you may think that, and I'm gonna say show this person, okay? So you may think that you have created a variable called name with name Vagni and place Bangalore. Actually not. So what you've done here is you have created a function called person which returns the structure as indicated there. So you don't have to actually say what the structure is. We haven't defined the structure, okay? So we're gonna write one more function called show person. Now show person is simply going to take person as an argument and show the person, right? I mean, it looks like I'm adding more code, but I'll show you why. Okay, just to make sure this still works for us, right? Now, what would be the type of show person now? Actually takes a person and then returns element. It's not void, because it has to return element. There is no side effects here, right? There is no void type, actually. So it, it's not a side effect. It returns an element, which then gets rendered by the run loop. It's out of here. So you can't actually print something, or you can't actually do it. So you're only returning structures, which can then get written. So that basically suggests that there is some sort of a virtual DOM in play, actually. So Elm already has a sort of a virtual sort of implementation of those things work. Okay, so now this won't compile because we, it'll of course say, you know, I don't know what you're talking about. It, I don't know what person is, actually. So let's create that type. So I'll say type alias person is actually name string and place a string. Okay, let me break this up so that. Yes, it is. So there is also, uh, yeah, it is, it's a bit like data keyword. It's like a record, actually. Yeah, they have, they have named it a little differently, so there is a, no, they don't have a data keyword. This is the data keyword, and then you have the type keyword. So, so we'll, we'll talk about this a little, uh, a little ahead when, 
So I'm coming from a JavaScript perspective, so since most of them are JavaScript, but I'd be interested to talk about it. If you've already done Haskell and if you want to know what the differences are, I'd be happy to talk to you about it. Right? Now, so now we know that this uh, person object comes, so this compiles actually. So we, can, we know that this person function actually returns a person. Okay? Now, this is a cool thing about Elm, is that it supports something called a scurrying, okay? Now, in a mathematics thing, you would, have, uh, you would have read about equations, right? And you say, if x plus a equals y plus a, you can cancel out a on both sides, and you can say x is y, right? So you could do the same thing. This is called a point-free form. So you can come here and say, hey, you know what? Person is there on both sides of this thing. So if it's mathematics, why can't I eliminate it? So I will say show person is just show. Okay, and that it still works. Okay, now why would I want to do that, right? So it doesn't mean that show person is actually show completely, right? I mean because the thing is that if I pass hello world to it as it was earlier, which used to work with show, it won't work with show person saying that because it says, hey, you know what? I think you mean to pass a person object here, right? And person record here, and not a string. So that way you can actually say, hey, you know what? Yeah, you are right. I need to pass a person here. And this works, right? So imagine the whole class of bugs in JavaScript that this eliminates, actually. So in many cases, you accidentally pass a number where a string should be. You accidentally pass a different structure where you expect it because the function you think would expect the same thing and on, so on and so forth. By explicitly making sure that these types are done, this becomes a compiler error rather than something going and blowing up in the, in, the, in the runtime, actually, which is much harder to track and debug and so on and so forth, actually. So, so let's talk about, I mean, uh, so we talked about some of those kind of things where uh, we talked about currying. So here, uh, show person, when you do this point-free form, actually, so it actually returns a function which returns something, which it expects something, and so on and so forth. So uh, ideally, in other languages, this may say, hey, you know what, you've forgotten a, a, a parameter to get passed, right, during declaration. But in, in, in Elm or Haskell, this is perfectly valid way of declaring something. Okay, let's go on to something more exciting, actually. So I'm gonna do a, um, so, so imagine if you are a typical, web designer, and you have to do this famous five-grid five layout, right? I mean, so you have this header, fixed thing, and then you have the footer as a fixed length, and then you have an expandable middle section where it has a, a fixed length left, fixed length right, and an expandable center section, right? Everybody knows how hard it is. It's almost impossible in HTML and CSS. I mean, it's possible, of course, but it's just that you have to do a lot of work to get that done. It's, it's, it's almost like, you have to understand Flexbox, you have to understand absolute positioning, you have to understand, uh, I mean, there are at least five way, three ways that I know of how to get this done, and none of them are elegant. I, I have to always look at Stack Overflow, or I always have to look at something to figure out, okay, I have to do these things in the ordered way, and float this off first, and float this off here, and then do stuff, and absolute position the thing below, and all. it's like crazy, right? Now let's do the same thing in Elm, and I'll show you how this is. Now, remember I talked about the fact that Elm likes signals. Right? So you have signals, and then you respond to them. So let's start doing something similar, simple, actually. So I'm going to take, I'm going to import mouse, which gives us all these things. And I'm going to say, um, so I'm also going to get signal. Dot map, show. Now, as I move the mouse around, it will show me my current window mouse position. Now, the beauty of this is I didn't have to write a on mouse move, and I didn't have to give a call back, and I didn't have to do all those things, right? Which is awesome, actually, right? The way this works is because the main now has a type of signal of, of element. Right? Now, it basically says that, hey, you have the signal of changing mouse positions. Because of this, this function actually gives you a signal of changing elements, 
okay? And then you work on the signal and you manage all the callbacks yourself. Don't bother me about it, but just do what I tell you to do, right? And this is really powerful, actually. Now we're gonna do this. Instead of mouse, we're gonna use window. And you can get window to dimensions. I'm sorry? Yeah, we'll, we'll come to fold P and things like that later. So you can fold over past, uh, that's there, actually. So for just for the fun of it, I'm going to um, uh, change the, so if you see here, if I change this window size, this these values change, actually. So it actually reacts on uh, the window dimensions. So we're gonna uh, leverage this fact, and then we're gonna do that, right? So what I'm going to do is, I'm gonna say, draw layout, so I'm gonna, let me go to full screen. So I'm gonna say, so I'm gonna write this function draw layout. Now draw layout basically gets whatever is the dimension as the argument, right? So, and dimensions is a tuple, actually. So it has an X and Y value. It's a coordinate ordered pair. So since it's an ordered pair, I can actually do X comma Y here. And I can, uh, or rather width and height, right? So width and height here. And this is a, this is called dereferencing, actually. So you, you have, you can dereference into deep structures by uh, saying that, okay, these are the variables I'm interested in, actually. And then you can say, uh, hey, so let me get a container. And the width and height of the container is this. I want everything to be in the middle, actually, of this container. And I'm going to say, um, have, a, have a simple kind of text here, uh, which is going to say, mm, mm. okay, this is a mouthful, but let me quickly try to break it down so that it fits into one line, fits into this viewport. So what I'm doing is, um, so I have this function width and height. Um, I'm basically starting from text dot from string. So the hello, this basically gets a text object, and I'm going to say that hey, print it in a left aligned fashion, in the middle of the container of height, width, and this thing. So if you if I do this, vertically aligned and center aligned. I mean, that's magic in CSS, right? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> to do this. This is done, right? So let's do the, let's do the, this thing. Now let's have some fun, okay? So I'm gonna do something. So I'm gonna say let uh, top box is actually going to be top box height, uh, or yeah. So it's both top and box. So header and footer have the same height. So let's say uh, box height equals, say let's say about 20 pixels. Right, and then I'm going to say let um, let the section height. I mean the sidebar height. So sidebar width equals 20. Okay, and then so if you have to calculate this, uh, if if you have to calculate the width of the main section, it's actually. Uh, 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 so main section height is actually then um, 20, yeah, so it's height minus 20 star two, right, basically. Right. And main section width, I should probably say main width, I mean, just save some screen real estate. So the main width is going to be, um, going to be W minus, in fact, I shouldn't use 20, so I'll use. Right. So I have these. Now, I know that this is going to be main width and main height, right? And this is going to be the main content. So.
I know it gets, I mean, uh, this actually will fit less than 80 characters, but because the font size is pretty small, it doesn't do that. But let me, let me continue doing this, right? So you have the main box and main content defined, right? Now let's try doing the, so in fact, uh, let me actually do the whole width for now, and then we'll get to this. So, uh, hold it. Right. Now I'm gonna say uh, the color for this guy is going to be, Um, so what this is going to do is, uh, oops, I'm looking for these things, white space, why are you looking for white Oh, I didn't say in actually. Okay, let me do that. So let me just return the main content for now. Mm, color is not found, so let me get color. So it actually creates this sort of thing and it has this 40 pixel thing in the bottom, but actually we need 20, 20, right? So let me, let me actually do this to 40 and you'd see that this increases. I'm sorry? So the, no, it actually always, it's not last event, right? So you're saying that I want to return main content, but what does main content do? Whatever is declared in the let block. So it's not an imperative thing. It actually does this variable mashing and then figures out how to, how to actually do this. So let's also do um, a, a, a box, actually. So the box is going to be container of uh, uh, width is going to be the whole width, and height is going to be uh, the box height. and assuming that this wants to do middle, whatever. And let me just give a, a element here, and so this is going to be show, hello, a show top, so. Uh, and we'll call it the bottom box. Now I can say flow Okay, let me also give these colors actually. So let me say color blue and for this I'll say color color dot green right so now this is this is given us this whole layout where the center one is vertically aligned sorry red is probably a bad color maybe we'll do orange yeah yeah it's supposed to be orange by the way so so now if you look at the uh, so the the thing is that now since it works on signals as I res uh, resize my browser if you see this, the hello actually, the other two things maintain their uh, height and the center one basically readjusts. This is amazing, I mean, this is, this is way more code that you would have to do in, in normal CSS of this thing. I mean, and you can do the same thing for, uh, I'm not using absolute positioning, right? There's no, well, it's, it's a little more nuanced than absolute positioning. So if you have thought about like uh, grid bag layouts or things like that, I mean, if you look at layouting in general, uh, this is very powerful in terms of layouting because you just said flow down and just gave these three, right, these three elements. So you could actually do flow right and also do this thing. So you can give different flow directions. So if you want an overlay, you can say layer element, uh, uh, a list of elements, and it will overlay them on top of each other, actually. So this makes it very, very intuitive to actually design UIs. So most designers actually think of them as flowing down, as think, uh, think of like, okay, it's, a, it's an increasable width or responsive width and so on and so forth. So now it makes it really simple to build these kind of apps, especially with this sort of a layout with Elm, actually. So 
so this is so generally so let let me also finish the uh, side bar so left box is going to be color so it's going to be the same so let me do this so this is going to be oops so you can see how this nicely composes and these are just functions that you have to deal with you can actually take them into different um, different places so let's do this so um so okay, let's keep this in does anybody have any favorite colors here so i'm running out of colors all i know is like red green blue and orange um yellow okay thank you so this is going to be uh, uh the width is going to be like a uh, uh, side side box width okay side bar width i should probably have given the smaller names actually so let me also do right and i'm going to give this uh, i don't know purple maybe this means the container that we have here is going to be uh, uh, and this is not uh, and this is not going to be v box height it's going to be main main content height right because uh, you, you don't want this to just be 20 pixels so and so this is going to be main width and main height and so you could say and you can replace main box here or what is it oh yeah let me call it main box Oops. Main width is not found. Oh, I deleted the. Width this width minus uh, sidebar width by two. Into two. So you can basically see that. So I'm going to increase this to say 50 pixels. So. Yeah, so you basically have this whole sort of uh, expanding thing, which is kind of hard in other languages, but makes it, it it's trivially simple in in this thing, right? So, I mean, of course, I've written everything in one function, but you can also have it written in other functions and so on and so forth. So this is one thing that I wanted to show. Let's see how how we're doing on time. I think we have a lot of time, so I'm going to show you uh, the next thing actually. So Elm also, I mean, how many were you in the? Were you, did you see about the famous demo on the first day? Okay, a couple of you. How many of you know about famous? Okay, very few. Okay, famous is a, 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 a JavaScript library which lets you do graphic intensive that sort of thing, and it has this thing called the mixed mode rendering, where it basically decides itself whether it has to do CSS 3D transforms or if it has to do uh, canvas or things like that. and it will automatically do it so you just have to draw uh, vectors or you have to deal with uh, drawing text or boxes or whatever and css i mean famous will take care of all that for you so we're going to do something similar with elm actually okay so here all i'm going to do is i'm just going to draw a blue pill right i mean we call it a blue pill because it's a blue dot actually so so i'm using this library called graphics.collage so we were using graphics.element earlier so this supports something called as graphics.collage and i'm basically creating a collage of 300 by 300 pixels and i'm going to put a circle with 10 pixels in here now if you notice it if you so let me do an i'm sorry yeah collage creates a box of the dimension and it basically accepts a list of forms actually so if you look at it i created a circle and i say filled color is blue actually and if you notice it's around 150 pixels 150 pixels here 
That is because when you create a collage, it creates this really nice coordinate system where the center is literally at zero, zero, right? So which is very nice. I mean, it's like your uh, six standard graph papers, actually, <laughs> that you could do where the center is at zero, zero, and you can start plotting and moving things, actually, which is very nice. So let's work with this a little bit and see what we can do about it, right? So I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to get a mouse. So I'm, what I'm trying to do is I'm going to animate this blue dot as I move my mouse. Let's see how that can tell, right? So and I'm going to also do import window dot uh, window, and I'm going to work on window dimensions. Okay. So let me get rid of this for the moment. I'm going to say signal dot map uh, drop in. Um, and I'm going to uh, work on two things, actually. So I'm going to look at mouse position as well as window dot dimensions. Okay? So that means that I'm mapping over two signals now, actually. Okay? So I'm going to say drop in. And this is going to get the X and Y because that's a mouse position. And then I'm also going to get width and height for the window dimensions. So now let's see what we can do. Let's have one start, right? So now, obviously, we need a blue pill. Um, so I'm going to have a let block to define it. In fact, just to save some space, I'm going to do this. Circle of, so initially what we'll do is we'll make sure, we'll make it so that the width of the, I mean, the radius of the circle is the x coordinate. So if we are in all the way in the left, We'll actually make the circle small. As we go to the right, we'll make the circle big. OK? So let's have this. And we'll say this is going to be filled with color.blue, because I like blue. Um, OK? And that's about it. So so when, when you use this arrow, uh, I mean, I failed to explain it. So this is the same as saying, um, so filled actually takes two arguments. Fill takes a color, and I'm sorry. Fill takes um, yeah. Fill takes a color and then um, circle of x. Okay. So let uh, let me just do okay. I'll, so I'll say in collage wh uh, of uh, Let me see if this works. Type mismatch uh, has unexpected type mouse dot position. So okay. So the thing is that when you have this, this expects a float, but you got an int. So do this. So now if you see, I get to do this, right? So as I move my mouse, it kind of animates very smoothly. Now, the reason I wanted to show you this was filled actually takes the second argument as this. But usually, you're chaining this whole thing. You want to do a lot more transformations. So in order to save all these brackets, you generally do circle of, uh, of x, and then you pass it into filled color. Now, the filled blue color actually gets a function uh, which takes in a a, sh uh, a form and gives back a shape. I mean, sorry, uh, takes in a shape and gives back a form, right? So instead, of, I mean, so this is the beauty of uh, Haskell and other languages is that when you don't pass in all the arguments, if you pass in only a few, I mean, a partially a list of arguments, it's not a syntax error. It'll simply return a function that will expect the other list of arguments, actually, which is very nice. That's what we are exploiting here, actually. It makes the syntax much nicer. Yes, it, there is a backward symbol which also works in the other direction. So you could also do that. So. All right, anyway. So uh, we have the collage that's written, and this would still work. Oops, no. Uh, sorry, I forgot the two float. In fact, you could also do this. It'll be an overkill. You could do two float of x, and then pass it in, and then, yeah, that would still work. Right? So essentially. So that's that's the idea. Now, now that we have this, we want to actually move it around to do this. Now, if you notice this, I want to make sure that when it's in the center, it's actually small, and it goes back both ways, right? So let's do the transformation because here, for for the mouse position, zero zero is here, 
but for uh, the uh, collage, the zero, zero is here. So we have to do a little bit of transformation to do this. So let's do that first. So I'm gonna say let uh, corrected x, I'm just gonna call cx because I don't have space for corrected. Um, so this is going to be uh, whatever x is minus w by two. Does it sound right? So whatever x coordinate is, you wanna subtract half of it with it. So of course this is going to, uh, we might as well turn it to floats here, so let's do that here. Because w by two, uh, you can't do an integer, division of an integer when it expects a float. So you have to make sure that this is converted to a float. And so this works. Similarly, let's do it for y. So y is a little bit more tricky because y, zero of y is still zero, actually. Right, when it comes here, that's when we need to do. So y is going to be, um, uh, it's gonna be h minus y by two. I think that's about right. Or h by two minus y. H by two minus y, right? Oh, sorry, y. Uh, no, because if it is here, I wanna show positive y by two, H by two, right? So this is going to be, as it enters here, I wanna reduce the value of this thing. So at H by two, it'll actually be, uh, uh, if it's y is H by two, it has to be zero. So. I think this is this will be right, actually. So this will be zero. We'll we'll know shortly. Okay. So. Oh yeah, C one. Thank you. Okay. So I'm going to just do a C X here, just to see how this works. Oops. Two float of C X is not needed because it's already a float. Um, and so zero zero, it's here. And it, if I move it, then it becomes this. So let's see if our y implementation is correct as well. So zero, zero is here. As I go big or small, then it's correct, okay? So our implementations are correct. So let us let me do a circle and let me do a cx here. And what I'm also going to do is, after I have filled this guy, I'm going to move him. I'm gonna move it from to Cx and Cy, essentially. So, this is a nice effect. As we move, it becomes bigger. I'm sorry? Move only has to take one xy coordinate, right? Why should it take two? Yeah, it's the destination of where it has to move. So it's not an animation if you think about it. So all it is doing is, I'm asking it to render the circle wherever my mouse position is, or my corrected mouse position is going to be. I'm also utilizing the fact that I'm changing the, uh, yeah, this thing, so it gives this nice thing. I mean, you can keep playing around with this forever, so, yeah, it's, it's kind of nice, actually, right? So, but you, you, could, you could see how it's really simple to actually work on these kind of things and then move on and so on and so forth. So, but of course, I mean, we are all web programmers, we, we get paid to do some serious stuff like login forms, right? <laughs> so yeah, anyway, so let's do that, actually. Now, let's do a login form in L, right? Now, so we, sh we saw two things. First was the graphics.element, uh, where it said that, hey, you don't have to worry about CSS, I will do the CSS for you, you do whatever. But then, I mean, there are some people who like CSS, who want to do that, and you want to do virtual DOM and things like that and all that. So uh, Elm has the fastest implementation of a virtual DOM-based rendering system. So th they use the direct virtual DOM library uh, on that basis, and then uh, they actually have, I mean, and all the data types here are immutable. I forgot to mention that. So let me go back uh, just a couple of slides where we did this uh, hello world thing here. So if, if I have to change the, value of this thing. So if I have to have another function, so it's just a brief suggestion. So if I have to say update update person, and I get a person and a name, I can update the person by saying, uh, um, uh, 
okay and i can show the update person Um, it can run it on the console, but okay, okay. Um, well, there have been there has been some effort to try to do that, but Elm makes a bunch of assumptions about uh, I mean uh, continuous signals and being asynchronous and things of that nature. So. It's, it, I mean, so far I've tried to make it work on an NPM console for trying to do unit tests on uh, on Elm, and I have not been successful actually. Um, so uh, there is talk in the mailing list community about you know moving it to this thing. But yeah, let me let me get to this a little. Uh, oops. Oh, what was that again? So let's. So I did some syntax error here. Yeah. Yes. Which one? This is this is working fine, right? So I updated the name of this guy. Actually, now when I say update, actually, if you say I get a person object and I replace the name with a new name, right? But what this essentially means is that it is actually giving you a new copy of this person. This this uh, the signature of this function would be update name. It takes in a person and a string. And it actually gives back a person. Okay, so that that is the signature of this function, right? Now, what this works, the reason it works is because it is actually going to create a new copy of name and send it back to you. So that way, it's immutable, and you can, I mean, the virtual DOM things and all work beautifully well with immutable structures. So, uh, if you are interested in how it works with React, catch me up later, and then I can I can show you some of the really good code bases that we have around it. Anyway, uh, that's a brief suggestion. So uh, I wanted to do that because uh, some of the code that we're going to look at now actually depends on immutable data structures for us to work. So let me run this piece of code. Um, so what this does is, um, I mean, it's basically a form where you type in a name, and then when you do this, your passwords don't match. And then if you finally have, have it match, then it says that passwords match. OK? That's how it works. Now let's look at how that works. Now. Uh, Elm has this thing called the start app library, okay? Now, uh, uh, remember I told you that generally the way in which uh, Elm applications and even my React applications are nowadays architected is that I have a big state model that I have which represents the entire state of the application, actually. And then I have a bunch of uh, functions that actually uh, make me go f from one model to the whole model. So. I don't replace parts of it. So I actually give back a new copy of uh, the model representing the new application state. And then I use the view to render whatever is there in the model. Okay? So it's a very linear flow. So anytime update happens, it updates the model. Or when I say updates the model, it actually creates a new copy of the model. And view always renders the new copy of the model, actually. So that's how it works. Now start app basically says that, hey, you know what? I know you're going to build your application that way. So I'm going to require an application that has this. So if you notice here, I'm not using signal.map. I'm not doing any of that stuff here, actually. So the startup basically returns a, a, a signal of HTML, actually, so which, which actually works. So it does all this thing internally, right? So you need to know what the model is. So here, obviously, the model has these three types, names, password, and password again. And then it starts off with an empty model actually. And it says these three strings, actually. Now, you, you could also do um, name equals empty and password equals empty and uh, password again equals empty and so on and so forth. But this is much e quicker and a better way of doing this, actually. right? And then you have an update. Now, um, how many of you have worked with a language which has enums in it? Right, so right, some languages have enum, and that's a very interesting thing because now you can say hey, it's either this or this or this. Now, uh, think of uh, the type here. This is called a, a, a abstract data type, ADTs in Haskell, actually. Um, now, 
the action could be a name which has a string. It could be a password that has a which has a string, or password again which has a string. All of which map onto the same type action. Actually, oops, am I out of time? I'm sorry. Elm is so much fun. <laughs> but anyway, uh, let me be brief and get back to it. So now, what what this does is that the view basically has this whole thing which which it does actually, which it which it renders, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, and then uh, when uh, an update has to happen, like for example, all these fields basically have an on input of target value, right? And then they say uh, they say signal dot message to an address, and the address is a general thing that is given by startup. So it basically posts a message there, and then it evaluates something, and then it it, it gets that stuff. Now because of this, uh, when these things work, so you have these. Uh, uh, you have this function which basically says, hey, what the value is going to be uh, by looking at the uh, uh, validation message. So it, it looks at the password as equal to password again. If the password is equal to password again, then it puts in green that this thing is there. If not, it says passwords doesn't, don't match, actually. So that's pretty simple, straightforward sort of thing. So if you have to, I was planning to implement a reset button and do the reset and update and so on and so forth. If you want me to continue, I can, but in the interest of time, I can take it up later, you can hit me up, whoever is interested, I can walk you to the rest of the Elm code base and show you some of the things that I have built with Elm. Uh, for now, I would like to open for some questions and we can go from there. Mm -hmm. So as I type in here, okay, so when I do this, um, so it actually, uh, it's always passing the signal, but uh, when I do an on update, it actually, passes a message on to the address bar, actually, sends a message to the address. Now, the address is being passed in via the view. So we said in startup, view is this address, right? So it knows where those actions need to go to. So it will actually send the action to the view, I mean, sorry, send the uh, message to the address, which the view will get after it processes the signal, because it will run it through the update, actually. In update, uh, whenever you have password of password, it basically updates the internal model, actually. And so the view will then get the new internal model. It will evaluate whether the passwords match or passwords don't match and render the appropriate thing here. So if I do ASDF and ASDF, then it works. Yeah, that's the point. So if you remember, Elm has static signal graphs. It always gets a signal. So it gets an empty model first. And then as the model changes, it get, keeps getting the new model every time. There is no, there's no point where uh, an event has to be raised for it to get the model. It'll always get it. There are no events. No, that's not required. So there are no listeners, there is no, you don't have to register for anything, actually. So that way you don't have to clean up for other things. That way there are no memory leaks. Yeah. Yeah. So you have these on events. So uh, even here, so you have, you still have this on event. So let me so go to those here. So on on key change here, there is still an event which happens. It says on input, right? So it uses the HTML5 input event, and it says that you get this new target value, which is a string actually, and then send it to this address. So you will get the string value here and then it converts it to two action and then does that. The two action is a curry trick, so whoever is interested in knowing how this, um, I mean, if you look at the, uh, if, if you look at the type of two action, it's string two action, actually. But it, it's, it uses a very sneaky trick to do it, but if you, if you hit me up later, I'll show you how, how exactly this type gets resolved, actually, so. Yeah, it's a string to enum converter only because all the actions actually have string in it if you notice here. Otherwise, this won't work. <laughs> so they just use that as a leverage because I was like wondering, what is string to EQ and then two actions? Yeah, it uses currying trick because all the ADTs are basically functions themselves. So each like name and password and password again are also functions. And uh, they take whatever value it's just to come out of that and it'll actually return back an action. So, so they have a type on that as well. So 
which will be pretty exciting and interesting. So anyway, so that's that's about Elm. Um, so you can find the slides. So it's on GitHub. And uh, we are hiring at Tarkalabs. It's a small plug that I have to. <laughs> so we are hiring front end. I mean, we are hiring good engineers. I mean, regardless whether you do front end or not. So if you're interested, hit me up. Thanks. Yes, please. Uh, large projects created with Elm. So um, let me show you something that we did. So it's not very large, but um, so this is something that we did for our client. So let me, let's see. Uh, so we are a distributed team. There's one guy in Bangalore. Uh, we have three guys in Chennai, one guy is in Poland. So most of us work from home. If required, we meet up. So sort of uh, a very different sort of work environment. And incredibly fun. I mean, we, I mean whenever, whenever we are at office, we are like usually around the TT table and things like that. So usually that's the excuse for going to office. All right, so this is a project that I uh, did uh, in Elm. So, uh, so basically, the visualization is meant to see what would be the case if, uh, if someone were to visualize the Facebook timeline in a 3D sort of view, actually. And you see the dates actually change, and you can like, move this thing around. And you, when you hover over something, you can, like, you can see that which video gets selected, actually. So as I select this, you see the white confetti dot getting updated below. You can show more or less. You can switch to a 2D view instead of a 3D view, and so on and so forth. So it took, a, took me about a week and a half to build this. It was meant to be a prototype of sorts. But I think it's a representative of a fairly complex Elm code base, and it works pretty well. So right now, it, um, it uses the Reddit API feed to get stuff. It just I mean, since I didn't want to like do the backend stuff and Facebook art and things like that. I just assume that whatever videos you get from Reddit feed is going to be your timeline videos. So that's it. Oh, thanks. Uh, you can catch me up outside, so I'll be around.